Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode, a long-awaited episode of the Art of Moo podcast with myself, Anthony Manuel, my good friend, Dr. William Raybar. We are still out here in the Canadian Rockies trying to find the grand unified theory of human movement biomechanics and the human experience as a whole because the body is the mind and so on and so forth. That continuum of existence in corporeal, mental, spiritual form, we're just exploring it all out here. Will just got back from Costa Rica, I do believe, so we're back in action. Uh, it's good to have you back, man. We have uh, we have a few different topics that we're kind of kind of passing back and forth in the DMs. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll kind of overview all four of them and bounce off the one that sounds the most interesting. Number one: Can controlled or slow resistance training in certain force vectors actually better prepare you for dynamic movement? Number two: How much retensioning should you do after myofascial release or other? sort of stretching and uh, and like r- tissue release work. How do you determine, number three, how do you determine the appropriate balance of tension and compression to in, uh, to actually attain tensegrity? Like what are the appropriate tensions in different parts of the body that uh, promote tensegrity? And then how do you, uh, have, number four, how do your ideas of yourself affect your movement? Out of those four, which is kind of most interesting to you right now? Oh, um, they're all, they're all fairly interesting. Um, let's go one by one here. And just right. go uh, with the first one, can controlled slow resistance training in certain force vectors actually prepare you better for dynamic movement? I feel like this question is uh, basically it just mirrors what the industry is asking, right? Because slow controlled resistance training could be uh, barbell training, right? Slow controlled resistance with tension. And then the thought process is that barbell training does get you better prepared for dynamic movement. So this question could be broad along the whole spectrum, right? I feel like when you're asking it, you're probably asking it more along the lines of very intricate biomechanics. Yes. But this is a question <laughs> that's broad throughout the whole industry, right? Like can, let's say because uh, certain force vectors, the word certain force vectors, hmm. a bicep curl is a certain force vector, right? And uh, does that prepare you for dynamic movement? Let's take a bench press, a slow bench press in a certain force vector, does it prepare you better for throwing or pushing? I would say in that case, no, right? I would say- Maybe, in, maybe pushing, maybe like a like in a pushing context, like if you're thinking of like a football lineman and you have to like push a guy that's in front of you, you could say maybe it's going to help you in that form. But like, if you think like when, I, when I'm thinking dynamic, I'm thinking something that's taking advantage of the elastic forces of fascia, right? So the throwing, but then punching too, right? Like I know- that a bench press with a straight bar is not going to translate very well to punching speed. Uh, I agree with that completely. Right. And that's where, that's where it all comes down to is if you ask enough questions, it comes down to, is there a blueprint of human movement? Right. Mm. Because if there is, then no bench pressing is not going to uh, get you better dynamic movement. It's going to get you better at, a, at pressing forward. Okay. And one vector. And then eventually just specialize you from pressing your back on your backs on the ground. You're pressing something forward and that something is a barbell. You will get better at that the more you do it. Right. So, um, it, it, I could say something like this. If I take my hip, right. And I put the stack, the joints in the way that they are going to move in real life. And I do a slow controlled movement in that force vector, then yes, it will get me better prepared for dynamic movement. And that dynamic movement is locomotion, right? So Hmm. that can be done by attaining more internal rotation in your hip or uh, working in the bow shape of your hip. Um, That will definitely help you get better dynamic movement. But this is a very nuanced conversation because, again, I don't think all slow and controlled movements are equal. I think they're unequal. And I don't think the industry recognizes that so much. Right. And this so, is why I said certain force vectors when I posed the question, right? Like in certain force vectors, can it can it uh, help translate to dynamic movement? Because even even the idea of, you know, when you're this is one of the other arguments of like if you're training a bow, a bow position that happens dynamically in the locomotive pattern as a result of lateral and spiraling forces is training that bowed position. Is that going to prepare you better for the di- the actual dynamic reality of it in motion, um, or if you train in the force vector that it happens and you create more stability in that force vector, uh, you know, in a, in a, an OKF situation, or maybe even a functional patterns thing where you're doing like a slow controlled chamber along 
a, a line of tension as it relates to maybe one of the anatomy trains, fascial lines, or one of the spiral lines that, uh, that functional patterns is recognized. Is that going to prepare, how does that prepare you better for dynamic movement? Are the forces in dynamic movement the same as these slow forces and will doing these slow forces, even if you're sequencing them properly, you're, cha- you know, like a, a functional patterns chamber, for example, it might be the correct sequence of tensions, but will that tension training, will that translate to something dynamic, something fast, something rapid, something where there's a lot more elasticity and balance and, and things of that nature. That's, that's kind of where my head was at when I first posed the question, if so, how, and how much more foresight do you need to prepare to actually, or, or how much specificity do you need for it to prepare you for those dynamic forces? Like you have to understand those dynamic forces very well, I would assume to train that certain force vector. I mean, this is a million dollar question, right? And those are three very nuanced, uh, situations. I have to assume that everybody knows like what functional patterns does, which most people don't know what OKF <laughs> does. Most people don't. And what GoTo does, most people don't. Right. So to me, I was playing with this a lot on vacation and you do load into a bow that I know. Right. So I'm going to assume that the bow is a good position to load. Right. As a, uh, if you do it properly. Okay. I'm also going to assume that uh, internal rotation is good to load as well because and that's like an okf style i I don't know exactly what okf does so i can't say but Mm. um i want more room in my hips in internal rotation right so i'm going to load it that way when i'm uh loading my hips back okay so i do think hips take a priority hip rib cage alignment or the dance between them takes a priority hips especially take a priority you should have good internal rotation in your hip because that's what uh leaves you first most people lose internal rotation of their hip Mm. especially when they're moving now when when it with regards to what functional patterns does i don't know exactly i know they do chamber sequences which i played with myself before i don't know if i do them exactly like they do i assume i don't Mm -hmm. so i can't quite speak on functional patterns but there is something to it um bringing different parts of your body together let's say the fascia from your or the muscles and the fascia from your uh, midsection, your core, let's say your ribs connecting one side of your rib to the opposite hip, having those fire together with the hip musculature. Again, I don't know if that's uh, functional patterns, but I do think there's something to that. And you see it along multiple movements, multiple sports. It's a universal pattern to me that takes precedent over, let's say, bicep curls, right? Mm -hmm. Or... um, Yeah. And again, to reiterate, I think the hips take a major priority. The rib cage takes a major priority. Them dancing together takes a major priority and the stacking and alignment of the joints take a major priority. What do you think about that? In terms of priorities for, as it, as it pertains to functional movement, I do agree that you should, you know, look at the, the major junctions of, of where locomotion is principally happening. And we're kind of using a model where, we believe the spinal engine, the waving of the spine is, is a principal part of locomotion. So naturally, if you're looking at the spine waving through locomotion, you're going to look at the ribs and the pelvis and its relationship to itself or to each other. And so, yeah, obviously bicep curls wouldn't be as relevant as learning how to create appropriate uh, midsection tension to create that that better relationship, right? I think one of the things that I'm I'm kind of curious about, right, is like, I, I suppose, you know, if, if I look at, cause, cause I've been diving a little bit deeper into functional patterns. Um, we had some great conversations with Naudi on, on the podcast and we, um, and I've, I've been kind of watching some more of his stuff recently and uh, talking to a few more FP practitioners and thinking a, a little bit about their approach. Right. And I think, uh, fixing dysfunction and understanding where dysfunction kind of comes from. And again, like you said, when you, when you boil it down, it's the question of, is there, is there a natural blueprint for human movement? We say yes, <laughs> you know? Um, and if there is a natural blueprint, that means that there's a more correct and a less correct way to move, which means that there are more correct and less correct ways to have um, tension in certain parts. And that was one of the other questions that I had is how do you determine the appropriate balance of, of tension and compression to attain that tensegrity, 
right? And and that's that's sort of like so if you're training in certain force vectors, are you you're you know you're conditioning your body to be more tense and and more relaxed in certain places and to to bias the firing of muscles in certain ways to hold certain levels of fascial tension in different places and to create a tensegrity structure within your system. That's sort of that is the way that I think that you could actually prepare your body for better movement is if you if if you improve your tensegrity throughout your structure by strategically creating tension and compression in certain parts, then you're going to help, you know, you're going to improve your your dynamic movement. And part of that is uh, it's not just the this controlled slow resistance training. It's also some myofascial release. Uh, you know, we just had that reel put out from our talk with football entangled with Taylor Davidson where he talked about fascial adhesions being a knot in the fascia that inhibits the gliding of different fascia layers. And so I think it's a combination of having that good glide in the fascia while also having the appropriate tension and relaxation in, in certain parts so that you have a good tensegrity structure. Now, are you going to attain that with a barbell squat and bicep curls? Probably not. <laughs> like, like pretty hard no. If, if you're talking about the, the natural mechanics of a, of a human body, the question is like, what would you do to do that? And I think obviously it's, it's going to be on a very specific individual basis, but looking at the, at the blueprint of how most people move and, and the, 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 the movement sitting, resting training habits of most people, what would you say? Well, I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? Let's, let's take this back to, let's take it back a little bit. Okay. So, um, you have to have the ranges of motion available within your joints. The joints have to operate like they should in meaning that you need the available ranges of motion in the joints for the task that you want. Okay. Let's pretend the task for now, because we can get as complicated as we want, right? We can talk about dancing and the splits, but let's not do that because it's a specialty. Let's talk about, you know, basic walking and running or, you know, running slow jogging. Right. So you don't need that much range of motion of your hips, but you do need some. And when your hips come forward, they do need internal rotation. So again, if you're older, restoring internal rotation in your hip is going to be important. Another important factor is making sure you're stacked and you're not leaking energy when you're taking a step. Okay. So um, th these are like, I, I think Gota again has the best checklist for this. Okay. Like the easy points of just being head over foot. And that's not like head over foot training guys. Um, it is just having your head over your foot as you land, right? Being back chain dominant, uh, you know, hips behind ribs. I, I still love this checklist personally, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, landing on the outside edge of your foot, whether you think that you roll to the inside, I don't really care, do whatever you want. Right. To me, I keep on, I use it as a pivot point and I, I roll sometimes to the inside of my foot and other times I don't. Okay. So it really, it really comes down to this joint, proper angles of joints, making sure you have the right ranges of motion for your joints, how you get that. That's the million dollar question, right? That mm. leads on to the next points where we're talking about tensegrity and myofascial release and where you're at currently. Okay. So I think there's a lot of an art to this. This is the art. All these questions are art. Mm. There's no way to know this or to have a, Right now, there's no papers on this at all. No research, uh, no formal research anyway. I think functional patterns and, you know, was pretty much leading this mm -hmm. at this point, right? In terms yeah. of, you know, having an, the, as many practitioners as they do and having facilities where they actually test things, but no formal research. And again, I think this is an art. And that's why Naudi, when he was on the podcast, was like, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do because I got to look at the person in front of me. Yeah, <laughs> And that's a, a lot of the time, that's what I have to do in the office when I'm working with someone in pain. I have to know where they're at and I can't refer to a paper. I can use it as a very start base, but I can't really uh, refer to papers to exactly what I need to do. And that's what a lot of the questions are like. It's like, mm. um, I think you need to realize that there's more of an art to the human body than an actual blueprint, but there's a blueprint to the basic foundational movements to the human body. Okay. So even with, even if you have the best system possible and you have it all figured out, you're going to have, and, and let's say you want to restore internal rotation of someone's hip. What if they have a labral tear 
you know, yeah. in their hip, which I do. Right. So I know because I have a good connection with my body and I'm, you know, uh, years of education on how the hip is moving. I know exactly where it is. I know exactly how to work around it. The average person's not going to be able to do that. Right. So there is an art to it that is not recognized and that that's just how it is period. Right. So when it comes down to it, it's easy, it's hard, or sorry, it's, it's easy at the start. You get a lot of fruit from just doing basic, you know, switching from hard training where you're just going up and down in squats or like deadlifts, linear plane, barbell movements, being able to move weight to moving your body in an intricate way, especially as you age, it becomes more of an art. Mm. It's kind of what I have to say about that. When, when you're talking about like the early fruits thing, I, that was kind of one of the things that I noticed is like my introduction to functional fitness training systems was, um, you know, you could, you could argue ATG would be my like sort of transition, my like gateway into unconventional movements, but even they're doing like linear frontal sagittal plane stuff, you know, for the most part. And so Goto was my first kind of introduction into more of a spiral dynamic, looking at more of how force transfers during locomotion. And I got a ton from it, from switching from, you know, my heavy gymnastics training, CrossFit training, barbell lifts, Metcons, doing the whole nine yards, uh, you know, sh shredding my shoulder labrum and needing surgery, all that stuff to, to just doing like functional training through Goda principally, you know, I did my recode, I did some one of a kind fitness stuff. Um, and I got so much out of that just from looking at these patterns and trying to emulate the patterns and trying to move my body and create tensions and, and, you know, stuff in my body from that perspective, one of the limitations that I found was over time and this is over time right like i got like i said you, you get a lot of fruit out of it like i don't ha i didn't have back pain anymore uh, my hips and knees didn't hurt um like a lot of the achy pain sort of things that i had just weren't there even like i i, I like i always had this like chronically tight spot in my thoracic spine that just always felt jammed just went away when i started being more back chain right um really really cool stuff but there are limitations too because I am so bound in my front line, like my serratus anterior, my lats, my pec minor, uh, different parts on my spiral line because I, ha you know, like I used to use a mixed grip deadlift when I went really heavy, so it would naturally start to shift in one direction. Combine playing guitar with that, so I have a lot of different adhesions in, in different places. So even if I'm putting myself in these positions, there's a lot of extra work that I needed to do or that I still need to do that I'm currently doing, right? This is where, where it's like, okay, I hit my point where it's like, all right, I'm not progressing anymore. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm, you know, I could spend hours doing recode work and it would still help for sure. But, I, you know, adding in things like extended myofascial release with deep breathing, doing breath work, paying more attention to not just being back chain dominant where my hips are behind my ribs, but what is the angle and the tilt of my pelvis and my rib cage in relation to itself while I am back chain, you know, is it, am I, am I in a, an appropriate level of pelvic tilt to be aligned so that my airway is open, you know, the way that Eric Tessie was talking about in our last interview, all of these little nuances start to become more apparent. So how much this is, the, these are the questions that I start to have is like, how do I have the appropriate balance of tension and compression to maintain tensegrity? I'm getting, you know, it's the 80, 20, I'm doing 80, 20 by looking at some of these go to universal principles but now there are more complex problems that just looking at that, that low hanging fruit is done and I still need more fruit for the rest of the season. Right. So it's like, all right, wh where, where else can I get it? So that's kind of where I'm starting to look deeper into the things of like, you know, spending a lot of time on a tennis ball in my abdomen, you know, and, and, and stretching out the, the front line quite a bit. And it's actually helping me get better back chain tensioning, you know, so like I actually have happening. What do I think is happening? Yeah. If, if you put a tennis ball in your abdomen, what do you think is happening in there? Well, it kind of because depends. That's a, that's a question that a lot of people have, right? Like mm. what is actually happening? Because, you know, the uh, research-based guys are like, you can't change fascia that quickly. And they're I think they're correct, right? Mm. About, that you can't. But what you can change is nervous system tension. I'm kind of answering the question, right? Yeah, nervous yeah. Well, that's tension. Then you can take advantage of that nervous system tension in order to gain more access into the front line or more space in the front line, then you can do movement, stretching, breathing into that area in order to relax your nervous system for the next time or have a better uh, awareness of that area. 
that's all that can be done with myofascial release. Nothing is being torn apart. And then you take advantage of that, you know, torn tissue. I think, I mean, that's what myofascial release was to a lot of people for a long time and still is. Right. right. Break up the Almost. tissue and then let, like, let it reform. Well, that, so see, yeah, like my process with a tennis ball, for example, is I find a spot on my abdomen, which is like bound up to like brace core bracing <laughs> was my, was my mantra for everything related to my, like the sports that I was involved in powerlifting, CrossFit, gymnastics, it was all like, how much core radiation can you produce to produce more force? So I would squeeze the shit out of my core. My, my abs are chronically braced. Like there's never a time where my abs aren't a little bit sucked in. And even when I relax them, I feel them. They're just like, wow, they're just like really, really, really tight. So I'll find a spot and it honestly feels like I'm like, I'm being stabbed even just like with a little bit of pressure right around my rectus abdominis meeting my, my lower ribs here. I'll, I'll sink into it and it feels excruciating and I just deep breathe and I relax and I sink in and eventually that pain starts to go away a little bit. I start to relax into it. That, uh, that inhibition, that in like that impulsive reaction of, of tensing with the pain, I ease off on it and then I can like ease into it a little bit. And I sit there for like five to 10 minutes in, in a single spot just allowing it to relax. And then, like you said, I get into the, these lengthened positions and I breathe deep into it. And I kind of signal to my nervous system that this is how I want my system to hold itself up. Right. So I do a little bit of retensioning in the back chain side. You know, if I want my front chain to open, then the back chain is going to lengthen and the front chain is going to open up and I, I'll do, do some big, deep diaphragmatic breaths. And that's, that's my process lately. That's been my practice in the last uh, couple of weeks. Well, let's talk about that because um, let's give a specific example, right? Let's talk about, so the abs are attached to the front in the pubis region, right? And if they contract, they should be bringing your pelvis forward, which means a posterior tilt, right? So tucking your butt if they're contracting, right? So let's say you're chronically, like in your situation where your abs are chronically tense, right? And you go into a hip hinge and without you knowing it during the hip hinge, your back starts rounding because your abs are squeezing. Okay. I'm just giving a scenario. I don't know if that's happening, right? Um, you can also do the same thing. You can go into a hip hinge, load your glutes and have your abs relaxed and just breathe into them, right? Mm. And that's a totally different tension or tensegrity that your body's experiencing. Now, maybe you're able to uh, get deeper into your glutes by hinging more because your abs are turned off. Okay. And your hinge, or let's say your posterior tilt may come from uh, more length from your, or more squeeze from your uh, hamstrings. I mean, I can go on forever with this and <laughs> hypothetical scenarios, right? But just the abs in a hinge would be a, a great example of where you would get your uh, tensegrity from, right? So a lot of people, let's say they're deadlifting, they'll squeeze their abs as they push their butt back. Mm. Is that actually necessary? Is it necessary when without a barbell, when you're just doing that movement to pick something up off the ground? Because mm. if you're used to doing that, and I go to pick something up off the ground with a hip hinge, and we're talking pretty high level here, awareness, Let's say I go to pick up a quarter, I push my butt back to hinge my hips and my abs squeeze automatically because I'm so used to doing that. My nervous system is just like, we do like this all the time. Is that unnecessary tension in your body that you're contributing to, to go on in the future, right? Where you can work in that hip hinge, relax, breathe through your abs. And then all of a sudden that's like a nervous system feedback and a, an mm. awareness piece that you can do without even actually doing myofascial release, or you can add myofascial release into it. Like you said, that will bring even more awareness. I'm, I'm starting to think that myofascial release is a lot of awareness. There's a huge that's, awareness piece to it, right? That's, so. that's what I've noticed. And, and, you know, for, for, for a lot of my practice lately, it has been active relaxation and it, it, it's, it's almost like an oxymoron, right? But it's an awareness. It's drawing awareness to where there's unnecessary tensions and seeing if I can let go of it. Because, you know, what, what people call muscle tone, my understanding is just a, a continual partial contraction of a muscle in a certain way. So it's ready to be driven into, into action. I don't necessarily want chronically partially tensioned 
abdomen. I saw Liver King in an interview was like, you can actually train yourself, man. You're like, it can be a way where your abs are always a little bit flexed, even when you sleep. And I was like, yeah, but I don't, I don't want that. <laughs> that's not what I, that's not what I'm after. I don't want these like brick abs that are just always like tensed up. I don't want it so that like, I can't fully extend my arm because my bicep is like, you know, I is just never relaxed. So there is a limitation though, because like you said, I deadlifted for a long, long time. I practiced core tension and core radiation for a long, long time. Even when I wasn't lifting, when I was doing everything, I was trying to condition my body to do that. So now it's just in my nervous system. Now it's just there. I can't like, I, I've done all my Jedi mind tricks of awareness to try and let go of certain tensions and I can to a degree, but I need myofascial release for certain things because I don't have, I don't have access to it. It's like, it's almost like there's a disconnect from the part of my brain that lets things relax. So it's, again, it's, it's, it's mind muscle connection in the opposite way of, of resistance training. You think of like a bodybuilder doing a bicep curl, trying to like flex his bicep as hard as you can. Myofascial release is the yin of that. You're trying to relax into this pressure as much as you can relax and breathe through pain so that you don't have that instinct instinctual reaction of of tensing up that's the 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 opposite practice that's what i'm trying to get into especially after doing you know nearly 100 days of uh you know 500 push-ups a day like just for this stupid challenge it's like okay how do i relax my pecs how do i relax my shoulders how do i get my traps to like fall away from my ears a little bit more these are all things that my nervous system is just fighting me up on because it's like, well, you, you, you hammered, you drilled this into us. You drilled this in. Like, why are you trying to make a stop? Like, we know that we need this. So it's very, very interesting. It, it is interesting. And, uh, this ties back into the way people lift weights right now. It's like squats, deadlifts. Those are all irradiating type lifts. And again, there's a difference between being a specialist at lifting weight at moving weight off the ground, up and down in a linear plane and being able to move your body. If you don't have access to weights at all times, let's say during COVID when people who were gym rats couldn't have the gym anymore, what do you do? You don't even know how to move your body anymore. And then eventually it ends at some point, you're not going to be a heavy weightlifter. So you have to be able to know how to use your body without weights. We weren't born with weight. There wasn't a barbell in front of you when you're learning to move. It, it's, it seems so simple, but like, I, it feels like idiocracy out there when you're talking to, to people. Yes, it's a fun thing to do. It's a specialty thing to do. And that is moving weight. It's a specialty. Okay. But it wants to be weaved into everything. Rehab, strength. Uh, this all has to tie in to what's already available. And that is the squat, deadlift, and those type of movements where an external object has to be moved from point A to point B, most of the time it's in a linear plane. We have to get away from that in terms of if you want to be able to move your body better and go back to the blueprint and moving your body by itself. Now you can use implements, that's fine, but I think there's a point where you have to go back and relearn how to use your body in a spiral fashion, stack your joints. And FP does this through chamber sequences, I believe, which is having uh, parts of the um, lines of the body basically come together. And uh, I, I would say lines of tensegrity, almost like Tom Myers lines, putting them together in a, I would say concentric way. Would you say that or eccentric? I don't really know. I don't know enough about Me it. I don't want to, I don't okay. want to speak on it without, uh, you know, without having gone through one of the human biomechanics specialists or even human foundations yeah. courses. Maybe I shouldn't talk about what they're doing, but basically, <laughs> um, the way I do it now is I stack the joints. I have a blueprint for how the body moves. It is loading into a bow. Um, sometimes I do that, uh, unloaded and then it loads into the bow. And sometimes I load the bow itself. Hmm. Okay. I go back chain dominant and then I go out and I move. I actually go out and I run and I walk and I box and I do actual movements. And that's the way it's done. It's pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. I think I no again, weights required. Like, well, no, and you don't, you don't need weights, right? I think one of the things that we were talking about discussing today was some of the 
social motivators, right? Like I think one of the big reasons that people are so eager to lift weights and specialize in that is because it makes you muscular. It makes you look conventionally attractive, right? And so if you think about well, what are these features that that are conventionally attractive? It's you know the the musculature, the the appearance of strength, the appearance of physical fitness. Um, that's that's a tough one to do, right? I think it's almost like an e- like like you can almost look at lifting weights as an easy way out for developing the appearance of of physical fitness because if you if you move really really well like i look at your physique now right i think about like back when you were a crossfitter like i think you were 40 pounds heavier covered in muscle but your physique now looks really strong right like you don't look beefy you don't look boxy you don't look like you know like like a superman level thor jacked or anything but you look really strong you look really physically fit and healthy and beyond that the way that you move also makes you look really really healthy you're lean you're you're springy you're bouncing like you're 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 strong right that's that's a hard like it's a harder thing to attain a physique in in a natural movement capacity because you have to be moving a lot you have to be yeah you have to put the work into moving well a lot of people are very very dysfunctional it's a lot of hard work but many people can just build muscle over dysfunction by lifting weights and that's an easier way to go about it it's it's fucking hard to take a step back and, uh, you know, not like the, there's, there's all the literature around, oh, well, you know, if you, if you like resistance training is associated with higher testosterone levels. So if you're not li- lifting weights, well, okay, as a man, I'm sacrificing a certain degree of like extra testosterone. Well, why, why do we, why are we all so obsessed with super high testosterone? Cause we're in a hyper competitive environment. We're trying to have more testosterone and be more manly and outcompete everyone else. It's, it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting paradigm that we're kind of trapped in here. It is an interesting paradigm. I almost want to get away from the whole dysfunctions paradigm. Cause the nocebo uh, paradigm is, is out there, right? Like it's so easy to be like, you're be, you're giving people nocebo, which is a negative thought uh opposite of placebo right a negative thought and because you're giving them negative thoughts it's going to get negative on them right so if you tell someone they're going to get injured they're going to get injured because you told them that and you put it in their head but this all predicates on the fact that there's no blueprint that there's no way better way to move there's no natural way to move and i assert that there is a natural way to move so if i'm uh espousing that there is a natural way to move and then that we should prioritize that over just lifting weights up and down yeah then uh if you don't believe in the fact that there's a natural way to move then you believe it's a nocebo right so <laughs> the narrative right now is that you should lift weights and that you'll just progressively overload meaning that if you load safely and just keep progressing then you're good to go but that's not what you see in reality okay in reality People always get hurt, go back down, and then the people who espouse placebo go, oh, okay, well, all you need to do is calm shit down and build shit back up again. It's to back up to what? You're not well, actually learning anything. You're going to be a jacked old guy who well, can't move. The, uh, That's yeah, literally exactly. what's going to happen, <laughs> period. So this is, I mean, this is a funny, this is the funny thing, right? Like where, where you said, it's like the argument is just load safely, but it's very, very argued about what safe loading is even within that community. It's like, well, what's, what does that mean? Like how much mobility, how much range, how much prehab, how much re uh, like how much recovery do you need? Th- these are all things that are fiercely debated because everyone keeps injuring themselves. So it's like, oh, well, like it's not that it's wrong. It's just that we did it wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, so, so that's an interesting perspective too. And again, like weightlifting is a specialty. If, if, if you want to do it, do it. But also realize that the more that you do it, the more that you're going to pattern and optimize your body. Like, Ido Portel was saying this for a long time. The more you specialize, the more price you have to pay. I would say that he would probably argue that the more that you specialize in natural patterns, the more of a price you have to pay. You're not you're going to limit the amount of creative movement that you can have. You, Absolutely. I still think that, like to a degree, that um, the movement optimists have have an interesting point because your body can do a lot of really really cool things if you gradually and progressively condition it you coax it into having the tissue resilience to do that now but what are what are what are the long term implications of that what are you optimizing for what are you progressively overloading to and long term if you are optimizing it for one particular pattern while your body is having to specialize in all these other 
things like walking, bending over to pick stuff up, throwing stuff. I don't know if we throw a lot in the modern day. <laughs> we're not hucking stuff to each other unless we're baseball players. Um, and we're not throwing spears at Buffalo to try and eat them anymore. But, you know, we're, we're still walking, resting, you know, how, how like what's, what's, what are the implications that it's going to have in our body if you specialize towards a particular, uh, you know, movement pattern? Like Ido Portal is probably not going to have a whole lot of, uh, you know, joint stiffness into his old age. I think he's going to do pretty good in terms of uh, joint resiliency and being able to to go well. But he's also going into all kinds of, you know, inefficient movement patterns. He's practicing animal locomotion as opposed to just natural human locomotion. Um, and he's conditioned his body to, to a bunch of different things. He also said that he's not doing his job unless he injures one of his students. <laughs> so, yeah, here's the art of it, though. It's like, Ido Portel has been doing that since he was a kid. Yes. You know, I watch my, my friend's baby and it can do, it, it's like a moldable clay, right? He's moving, his hips can move every direction and that's the case, but that's not the case for most people. Most Westerners jump into uh, a movement practice like Ido Portel's in their late twenties. They're going to have some issues because they just don't have the ranges of motion available. Mm -hmm. And I think you do need to go back to the blueprint first before anything else and see wh what you have available right? In that you're going to do that most of the time. Again, the Edo Portal stuff is his specialty. And you have an advantage if you start it when you're five and you can do it slowly and um, you keep doing it and you have those ranges of motion available. Mm. Um, I just don't think it's the way to go for most people. It's super hyper-specialized. Most people are sitting at a desk. Most people are hurt and slightly injured already, you know, and um, most people don't move very well even walking down the street. Okay. We're talking the vast majority of the population. So the easy fruit is to go back to the blueprint of walking and running. Um, you know, like I, again, I like Goda's checklist for the easy way to start. Okay. If you don't really know what you're doing and look at the past episodes, if you want to hear about that, mm. but, um, even being in resting positions, I don't see anybody in the industry talking about even the nocebo guys don't talk about this. They're, they're waiting for a paper. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, they, they, they argue that there's no such thing as bad seated, seated posture. I've seen a couple of posts. I mean, I don't want to paint them all with the same brush. I'm sure there's uh, you know, different opinions, but for the most part, it's like the argument that I see is that there's no such thing as bad seated posture, just bad posture for extended periods of time. So if you're sitting in the front chain or you have a kyphotic curve, and you're sitting up straight doesn't really really matter too too much as long as you're not doing it for too long that's the argument just change your position frequently so that you don't get kind of glued in or stuck that, stuck in that position that's what i was taught at school as well like in cairo school it's like vary your positions that's the and i still think that's a great thing to do right mm -hmm. but um i i think sitting itself does for a long time does present problems i think the natural resting positions like being on your knees but between your heels with your heels away is a natural resting posture look at what the kids do okay at some point you stop doing it because you saw a chair or you, there was a chair at school otherwise you would be doing it to an older age crisscross mm. applesauce um size a uh cowboy position even you'll see it amongst uh asians eastern europeans who still do this and they have better hip range of motion in general i guarantee it i don't have yeah. a paper on it, but I guarantee they have better hip ranges of motion than Westerners who sit all day. And why? Because you're stuck in one position. It's pretty simple, right? So there is natural resting postures that go along with natural movement. And um yeah, so that's what that's what I think there. There is natural resting postures that you should be in. Well yeah, I, I I don't disagree with that, right? Like that's something that I, I you know the Slavic squat, the Asian squat, those are all stereotypes for a reason, right? And uh and Westerners can't do it. You know, like that's why you usually get a squat assessment when you come into a gym in the United States or Canada. And the first thing they do is make you squat and you're kind of awkwardly with the duck feet and you're kind of like leaning super far forward or you can't even get your hips to parallel to your knees. It's just a, it's a mess, right? Um, it's, it's definitely a thing. This is actually, you know, the nocebo thing is semi-related to this idea. One of the other questions from th this message I sent you is like, how do your ideas of yourself affect your movement? So obviously, if you have the idea that you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to hurt yourself, <laughs> you know, yeah. 
you can hurt yourself without thinking that you're going to hurt yourself. I've done that multiple times with weightlifting. I, th- I would think that it was bulletproof and then you know, it would tweak my back doing something stupid. But your ideas of yourself affect your movement. I started reading this book from a guy. Uh, he writes a bunch of ebooks and he has a blog uh, called uh, The Cows Eat Grass Blog. He's a metabolism guy. He talks a lot about metabolism, but he, uh, I was messaging him back and forth a little bit. And he's like, oh, go, go check out my new Kindle book. It's called The Feeling Overrides Nutrition. And the idea behind this book is that how you feel about how you feel, it makes a bigger impact than the original feeling. So usually what happens is we, we get a feeling within our body. He related it to metabolism, right? He related it to energy or to other things. And instantly we will create a story about it. We will think something about it. And the thought happens at a really rapid clip. But that thought itself creates another feeling and that becomes the feeling, you know, the feeling about the feeling (laughs) that you, that you have. And it, it sort of amplifies itself and it can become this feedback loop that impacts your physiology in a more profound way. I found that very, very fascinating, right? Because if you just have back pain, that's, that's one thing, right? Like you can, you can have back pain and you can wiggle your way around, but like there's, there's stories about back pain. There's being pissed off about having back pain. There's like, bemoaning having back pain there is identifying with having back pain there is all kinds of things that you can layer on top of back pain that is going to create a deeper experience that is wildly unpleasant so i i found that fascinating and that that that's kind of what it, like initially made me think it's like he was relating this all to metabolism talking about how your feelings about your metabolism and your different things negatively or positively impact your metabolism and i'm like this is definitely correlated to movement as well Oh, I mean, there's, there's so much to this, right? Like, what does yourself actually mean? Let's, let's take it to mean the more superficial aspect of yourself. Like, let's say, um, in my younger years, in my twenties, I thought it was bulletproof. So I would put on, you know, way too much weight and try to try to just do it. And I thought to myself, I was special because I had that mindset that would, I would, it was David Goggins basically right? Yeah. for heavy weightlifting. And I did get hurt a few times, but that's okay because I would relax and then build shit back up again, right? Like exactly what is said to be done, right? And then mm. there's the aspect of, um, like you mentioned, pain, right? Um, there is a correct, a cor- like they're correct about pain and nocebo there a lot of ways because. Um, let's say for instance, a long time, and I think this is still happening, avoiding flexion with back pain. Okay. So like, let's say you hurt yourself. Don't flex over. Yeah. Maybe when you're at the acute stage and you can't extend or flex, right? Right. I would still get people to move in pain-free range, even if it's an inch or two, right? But at some point you have to come back to flexing your back. And if a person hasn't done it, and I have multiple experiences with this, multiple hundreds of experiences with this, of patients who are like, I do not want to do that. No, 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 that's going to hurt me. So that's a placebo in their own head. Mm. So to themselves, they're not able to access that range. So they won't be able to access that range. They're going to be in fear. And the worst thing with fear is that it usually, like, I'm going to say within pain and within your body, it does come true. Because... Like, let's say you play golf, you're going to have to flex. If you're in life, you're going to have to flex. But in your mind, you can't flex, right? So um, you're avoiding doing that in the gym or you think you can't do it, but you can. You just have to actually, and this is where I actually agree, you kind of have to progressively overload that flexion to let your body know that it's safe. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing you do and that's the primary thing you do. There's still a blueprint behind that. Okay. So yeah, do go back and flex in that, uh, painful range by progressively overloading. And I actually, I go to pain, like let's say someone's back hurts, right. And they can flex over, let's say 60 degrees. I'm just making up a number, right. Mm -hmm. But at 50 degrees, there's no pain. I get them to go to 50 degrees and I get them to feel out in different ranges. Okay. I can do 50 degrees and I get them to play with that. And I say play because I see it as a line. It's like, there's a red line at 60, you play at 50. Mm -hmm. And then that line just goes up. Now you're playing at 60 and the line goes up, the pain line goes up to 70, right? So you start playing in that range and you're telling your body you're safe, right? So the vision of you now 
becomes a person who can actually do something without pain or flex without pain. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, there's so much to yourself. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, the, 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 that's, that's, that was my old rehab strategy as well. You know, is, is kind of like play around that feather zone of right, right before where the, the, the range of pain was. And what you're talking about, there's so much to the self. I mean, yeah, this is, this is like a whole other podcast topic, right? When I was, I was watching a, an, an interview with Jordan Peterson and he was, uh, he was being interviewed by a Muslim guy and the Muslim asks, like, if I gave you unequivocal proof that, you know, the things in the Quran were accurate and that everything was, you know, was, was scientifically verifiable, would you uh, believe in Islam? And Jordan Peterson is like, no, it's because there's, there's, there's the issue of what you mean by I and what you mean by belief and what you mean by Islam and all of these things that, that, that we're taking for granted and aren't well defined. Right. And, and if you think about, you know, from, from the religious context, that's really interesting. It's like, well, what is the I that is believing? What does belief mean? Does belief mean that your statement is like, I'm doing this? Is it a, a source of embodied action? There's, there's all like, we're, we're getting into like deep philosophical territory talking about the nature of the self you know, as it, as it pertains to, uh, you know, movement though, there is, I think there is an experience of the body. There is an experience of movement. There is the movement itself, the actual mechanical realities of movement. Then there is the perceived experience from the internal, you know, like you, you are perceiving the, the sensations of this mechanical reality. There's the external perceptions of the efficiency of the mechanical reality from other people. So there's the outside view. Um, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. I think there are objective realities and subjective realities that are sort of intertwined with one another. And it's very, very hard to kind of pin down what the truth of movement is. And that's, you know, (laughs) we're, we're being a little tongue in cheek in our intro when we're saying, trying to find the grand unified theory of human movement and biomechanics. We know this. Well, let's give a little bit of an example with what you're talking about with nutrition earlier, right? So like Mm. the thought on top of the thought if you eat something that let's say you're, you heard about gluten and gluten's bad and you ate some bread that was made by your mom, lots of love. There's a lot of love behind it, but you have it in your head that the gluten is bad. And now you're feeling shame and guilt for eating that gluten. It's probably going to be worse for you than if you're like, oh, that came from my mom. It came from a lot of love and I'm going to eat this and be happy about it. You're going to have, I'm going to assume you're going to have a worse outcome in scenario A, where you have shame and guilt about it, then scenario B, where you're happy about it. But then there's a line to it as well, right? So I used to think with nutrition, I used to eat whatever I wanted for the longest time. I went like three years eating pizza and KFC for like literally 90% of my diet. And I was working out a ton, so I didn't look bigger. Like I, I blew up muscle wise and I was a little bit fatter, but I didn't appear to be uh, obese or anything like that. I just hear <laughs> Jack. So I'm like, haha, suckers, this is working out and it's not working <laughs> out for you. And, uh, like all these people who are watching their diet, it's like, it's, it's a waste of time. So I had this like really, uh, grandiose thought in my head that I was beating the nutrition game because I was able to do it. Right. And I looked at the outside markers of how I looked as a way to gauge it, but I was like 20, Two or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> right? So nothing was catching up to me. As soon as I got into my thirties, it's like, I still kind of thought this for a long time. I still wasn't buying into any of the nutrition advice. Um, I started eating a little bit healthier, just, you know, um, kind of naturally, but I still would eat pizza. I'd still go out and like, you know, have fast food, not a problem. But now that I'm eating healthy, I do see the difference. I see a yeah. massive difference, right? <laughs> so I didn't know because I had the positive thoughts in my head. And even now that I look back, I was like, I wonder what would happen if I had shame and guilt about eating that pizza at that time, how it would have went, you know? So I I haven't read any of the research on this, but I have heard that there is research on how you feel about what you eat affects how it's metabolized. I I've, I've heard that there's research on that. I can't, I can't verify it. I'm going to look it up later and we can, uh, I'll do a follow up on our next episode, but like, I'm pretty sure that like, that's, that's a hundred percent a thing, man. Like 
it, there, like you said, there is, there is still reality that happens, right? Like there is still objectively healthier and unhealthy food, but that's the whole, you know, Napoleon thing where he thought he was like this superior human being. So he took triple the amount of poison and still didn't die. You know, it, it was this idea that his, he was just too immune to it. He was, and, and again, don't know if that story is true. Just heard, you know, one of those, one of those stories. Um, but I have definitely experienced that. I even anecdotally, when I am a little bit more obsessive about like watching my nutrition, I tend to not lose weight <laughs> as easily. I tend to not like my performance isn't quite as good. My energy isn't as high. My metabolism isn't rocking. But like I was, I was, you know, just as an experiment, like letting go of it completely, eating about 4,200 calories a day, eating about a pint of Hagen dazs ice cream every day, um, still eating mostly healthy foods, foods that I, I knew I enjoyed, but like the, the narrative that I created was that I am eating high met, uh, high metabolism foods, foods that support my thyroid foods that are increasing my energy output. So the calories in don't matter as much because they're producing a hormonal environment where there's more calories out and I'm exercising. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, haha, like I can eat all of the, I can eat all these calories and my, my calorie output is so high that I'm not gaining weight. And I was eating like I, I, uh, I experimented. I was like, I wonder how high I actually have to go to start putting on weight. And I, I, I went like, uh, like five days eating 5,200 calories a day and gained half a pound. I was like, all right, that's my threshold. <laughs> that's kind of nuts. But like anecdotally, like I had that, I had that same sort of mind over matter experience. Now, I don't know if that was just, you know, the narrative that I had about, you know, metabolically supportive foods was, was real you know, but I do know that I wasn't gaining weight eating like 4,200 to 4,500 calories a day for months. Uh, yeah, that's, it's very interesting. A little caveat to what I was saying before, I did get sick like four times a year though, right? Like I, <laughs> I would have flus. I would, I'd be very prone to the flu, right? Or being sick. So now I, if I get sick, it's like one or two days and I can snap back real quick. I have a lot more energy throughout the day. Um, so there was consequences. They just weren't immediate. Um, it, it's very interesting. I don't know. Like, um, I think there is a spiritual aspect to it. I'm, I'm going to, again, go back to, we don't talk about this enough, that the example I gave of like your mom making you a meal with love and you embracing yeah. it is much different than you taking that meal and having shame and guilt over it. That will metabolize differently. Whatever you want to call it, there's a spiritual aspect to it that is different that can't be calculated with research. So you're not going to find it in research, but this is a belief I have. And that alludes back to the power of your mind, right? Your spirit and how you go about things, right? So that goes with nutrition, that goes with, you know, health and fitness. It goes with the, how you view yourself as well, right? So those are all kind of interesting points on, yeah, so, on that. So, so the question of like, how do your ideas of yourself affect your movement? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. If you, I think if you believe you're really stiff and you, you, you believe you're very tense, you will be. Um, I know that I started to develop the belief that uh, I just don't have pain in my body anymore. Like I don't, I don't experience joint pain. I don't experience aches. I don't experience. So, so when I feel like a little bit of tension, I had like a little neck kink the other day for the first time in over a year. Um, and I think it was just cause I was doing too much myofascial release in, in a part that I didn't need to actually like un detention. And, uh, so I did it and then I went to sleep with a pillow and my neck was crooked up and I woke up, I had a little bit of a kink. I was like, this is weird. It was gone, you know, by the next day, like less, less than a full day. But it was just, it was strange. Like I have this belief of myself that like, you know, I'm still muscular. I still have work to do because my, my problems didn't disappear. I still have imbalances. I'm working on it. But like the work that I'm doing is moving more and more towards less pain and better movement, less pain, better movement all the time. And the state that I'm in, I just don't experience pain. And so my body doesn't generally experience pain. I have good digestion. I have, you know, like uh, like, and I'm sitting in a chair 12 hours a day, like full transparency. Like I'm not doing really well with my floor sitting lately. Like I'm like two months 
ass in a chair doing work on my computer. I still go for walks. I still do all my biomech work. I still do all my, you know, my, my tensioning and my retensioning and my detensioning and my MFR. I do all of that stuff, but I'm sitting in a chair for 12 hours a day, no pain whatsoever, none. And that's just because, I mean, I'm either doing the right stuff uh, or, and it'll catch up to me eventually. Cause again, like it, that shit will, but I'm also, I'm reversing a lot of the, the patterns and I'm, I'm creating deliberate tensions to, to reverse it. So my ideas about myself before were that I'm strong and that I'm tense and that I can lift a lot of weight and I can, you know, I had the, the, the high shoulders, but like your, your ideas about yourself definitely impact how you move. You've talked about it a lot when you're, when your mind was more rigid, your movement was more rigid. When your movement is free, your capacity for sort of outside of the box thinking is also free because your movement is outside of the box. I mean, the easy way to see this is someone who's confident versus someone who's not confident. You know, <laughs> it's just like, there's a, there's a posture to it and they will move differently. Right. And everybody knows this. You don't need a paper to see it. You can see it visually. If someone's confident, you see it, you know it. If someone's sad, you see it, you know it. Um, and it happens within the movement, right? So um, this is something that is outright right in front of our faces. Your perception of yourself does tie into your movement on the higher level uh, where let's say you're someone who believes that they, like you said, are not a person who is in pain or is not a person who uh, is lazy with themselves then you'll put the work into yourself, right? So that's where the David Goggins kind of mentality blends into the biomech where you don't go quite full David Goggins. You bring, <laughs> you bring it into, I'm going to work on myself instead of these external goals. Mm. Okay. Like these, like just the goal of having a thousand pushups, no offense. Okay. So like, just <laughs> I'm going to do a thousand pushups to get my pecs big. It's like, I'm going to work on my body and get my hips to move better, to get my hips more range of motion, to link my hips to my rib cage, to expand my rib cage with breath. Put the time into that and you'll get more fruit at the end because you have the perception of yourself that you're able to do it or that you're the type of person that does do that. Mm. But I think most people right now and even myself in the past, it was, I'm going to go hard at the gym. I'm going to do the external exercises and get the numbers up and that will be my external metric mm. to my internal self so uh, yeah it's it's an interesting topic it's really really philosophical it's yeah. very it's very philosophical i think we should have a, a full podcast episode dedicated yeah. to this and maybe even invite some other people on to kind of dive into this a little bit more because it's something that well i mean we both think about it and experience it in, in, in very deep ways. And we, we have a lot of experience in, in exploring it. I have a few different angles that I'd love to do, but we're already pretty close to the top of the hour, which is kind of nuts. Um, cool, cool conversation so far. Any other major thoughts on, on any of the four topics? I know the one that we didn't really dive too deep into was this idea of retensioning after myofascial release. For me, um, I, I felt like the retensioning we kind of talked about when we address the idea of like doing the myofascial release as a nervous system relaxant to, you know, access different ranges and then actually accessing these ranges that are biomechanically appropriate. And that will do the retentioning in a biomechanically appropriate sense. Like you're creating that level. If that makes uh, sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, I think there's a couple layers to this one. Like I work with people in pain and they want their pain gone. Right. Mm -hmm. And the pain is getting in their, the way of their life. So I'm going to do, let's say, myofascial release on them with the goal of getting rid of their pain and not necessarily take the next step of integrating into the movement, right? Which I would love to do, but that's not what people are coming into me for, right? Now, if, if I had my way, I would be like, come in for a few more sessions, and which I try to say, and I'll teach you how to not have this happen again, not have those tensions be in that area. So let's say it's in their low back, right? They're stiff from the day. They haven't moved in their chair. They're tense from their work. They've had a bad day. Some people know this. And they're just like, I'm very stressed, you know, and this is where I keep my stress. And we'll talk about their shoulders or their low back, right? But in that case, they're super tense in that area. Let's say I release it. 
I would love to get the hips fluid and the hips connected to the ribs again and have it nice and fluid. And I would, you know, show them some basic movements, some basic, um, connecting the, the ribs to the hips and, uh, you know, a couple bow maneuvers, a couple of, uh, you know, uh, rockers, let's say, right. There's different ways I do it with different patients, but I would integrate it back into a movement. The way I did it in the past was that I would myofascial release one or two minutes just to get the tissue loose. Then I would get them to stretch or move. And then I would get them to do whatever they want, walk or run or, mm. or do whatever movement you want to do. Now I'm a little bit more specific with it, but you can get a lot out of just myofascial release if your goal is to relax. Mm. So at night, I'll just do my spine with, yeah. uh, I have an implement. It's kind of like a double lacrosse ball, but it's a little bit more intricate. And I just go up and down my spine, uh, 20 seconds ish per segment. And I give it a little bit of attention. And if I need to be there for 40 seconds, I'll do it. And then afterwards, I might move my spine or I might fall asleep on the floor right afterwards and just relax. I don't know. It depends on the day, right? But if I want to retention afterwards, I have to get up and I have to actually do the work in a natural motion back to the natural blueprint, which we've discussed before. I want to get it back into that pattern. So that, that was sort of, you know, when I was talking about retensioning, right? Like even if you're opening your front line and then you're getting into the back chain, you don't have to retension your front line because it will have the appropriate amount of tension if you're in the back chain for the locomotive pattern. I think, I think to a degree, it depends, right? Like for me personally, cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to relax my abdomen so much that it like, you know, it's just jelly. You know, that's almost impossible for me. Like if, with myofascial release with any manual therapy, I'm not going to like you know, completely and totally relax my abdomen. So what I'm saying is like, how much retentioning do I need? Okay. Well, if I, if I relax my front line and then I get in the back chain, well, that, that would, well, that'll bring me closer to a natural equilibrium of, of the tensegrity structure that my body naturally wants to be in. Yeah. I think, I think it's very individual, right? Like mm -hmm. people are coming in with different issues and like, you know, different tensions in different spots. That's kind of like the therapist end of it for me. It's like figuring that out and um, working with the individual person. For me, it's like, I've been doing this for so long. I know where my tensions lay and I know the feeling behind it. So I don't have to, I, I just kind of know where I'm at, right? I don't need as much and I don't need to, um, integrate it into a pattern every single time, but I still do that as like a workout in itself sometimes. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so um, it just depends. We can talk a little bit more about that in another episode because I think that's an episode on itself as well. For sure. For sure. So let's, yeah. let's do a quick recap in terms of the questions. Some, some of our answers about that, like can controlled sl or slow resistance training in certain force vectors actually better prepare you for dynamic movement? We said yes, as long as they respect the natural blueprint blueprint for movement, not all resistance training and not all force vectors are going to translate to effective dynamic movement. Um, you know, a squat might, a heavy squat might get you better at vertically jumping if you were, you know, emulating the squat pattern in that specific force vector. But if you were talking about spiraling and lateral forces of natural movement patterns, like running and throwing, you have to train within that force vector. Would yeah. you agree? And, and yeah. And to add to that, you'd have to train stacking your joints. If you're missing ranges of motion, you have to train that back into yourself hmm. and, uh, on a higher level, you want to train the tensions and compressions within your body. Again, that's a way higher level, but yeah, stacking the joints is big. Um, and working with the natural motions of your body and, 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 the and, and, uh, lifting weights will get you better at lifting weights, but you have to learn to use your own body without lifting weights. Mm -hmm. It's a good, good recap. How much retensioning should you do after myofascial release? That was the, the last topic that we just kind of touched on here. Uh, it depends. <laughs> Sorry. It depends. It um, you can use myofascial release as a relaxation technique to just chill the fuck out um, before bed. That's actually really nice. Getting some of that decompressive state while you're lying down for eight hours, assuming you're getting eight hours of sleep. Um, but you know, it, it's going to be an individual basis because we don't know how much myofascial release you're doing. We don't know how much tension you need. It, it's, it's going to be contextual. So it really depends. How do you determine the appropriate balance of tension and compression to attain tensegrity? Again, I think that that is, that's an individual case by case basis. Um, 
and we can kind of look at the natural movement blueprint in in terms of how the body handles compression and tension through dynamically and sort of determine what's the baseline at rest. And I, I think that would kind of be how you reverse engineer that just off the top of my head. We didn't dive too deeply into that. No, question. I just want to say one thing about that. You always have tensegrity. That's how the body works is it's a tensegral structure. It's a structure of, uh, it's a dance between tensions and compressions versus how the industry looks at it now as a continuous compression structure. Okay. So you always have tensegrity. It's just where does where do the tensions lay the most hmm. okay and you can rebalance that through specific exercise or you know somewhat through myofascial release but again there's always tensegrity there it's just where is the balance of the forces yeah and then how do your ideas of yourself affect your movement well just look at body language and emotion that's that's like pretty straightforward that's another one we have to dive into is body. Yeah, we'll, we'll do we'll do a whole episode on that. How do you yeah. feel? How you feel about how you feel about your movement? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, ladies and gents, that was episode eighty four. Thank you for your patience in us getting back on track with these. We uh, we missed doing them, and we're very very excited to have some more live episodes for you. Uh, you can follow me at Anthony Manuel M A N U E L E on Instagram. You can follow Will at the Art of Move. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube, subscribe and like this video. Let us know what you want to hear about next. Thank you so much for checking us out. We will catch you on the next episode. Have a good one, guys.